This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, this is Susie Stokey. I played Sandy in The Power, and you are listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. And you know what? Tommy's Catholic. He picks his belly button for Lent. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming John Penny. John, um, you know, he started out, he was a uh, assistant editor over at New World Pictures back in the day, and um, he was an assistant editor on Body Rock, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, Larry Cohen's and stuff, and at that same time, he was also affiliated with Stephen Carpenter and Jeffrey Obro, and um, he worked on their movies uh, the Dorm That Dripped Blood, The Power, which uh, Susie Stokey uh, was the star of, um, Torment, which was a Bay Area-based horror film, The Kindred, with my good friend Julia Montgomery, and uh, Return of the Living Dead 3. Yes, he concluded the trilogy back in 1993, the movie celebrating its 30th anniversary, and we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff today, and I can't wait it's going to be a great conversation. He's such an underrated force in horror, and it's going to be an honor to talk to him today. Also, God, I, I, I'm saying this way too often. Rest in peace, to Pipe, Piper Lori. I uh, was supposed to meet her at Monster Palooza back in 2017. She was scheduled to be there with um, Nancy Allen and William Katz, and I think PJ was was there too. I, I did meet her, you know. I, I, yeah, I think I met her at the at the next uh, Monster Palooza, as a matter of fact. But nevertheless, I'm sad that I will never have Piper Laurie's signature on my Carrie DVD like I have all the others. She was such a great actress. The Hustler, that's one of my grandfather's favorite movies. Also, rest in peace, Suzanne Summers, 76 years old. She was around forever. She was the mystery girl in American Graffiti, the swimming pool girl in Magnum Force, Chrissy Snow on Three's Company. She was on Step by Step. She's the sheriff. She's an icon and a native of my hometown. Rest in peace, Suzanne. So yeah, here is my interview with John Penny. Hello. Hey, John. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. Uh, thanks for calling. Absolutely. This is such a great honor. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Absolutely. So, going back in time, I can imagine growing up the son of Raylan Moore and Ward Moore that your creative juices were flowing early on in your childhood. Well, you know, it's funny you would say that. Um, it was kind of like the last thing I ever wanted to do was be a writer. Uh-huh. Uh, because I, I lived around it, and... Um, it always seemed so, uh, you know, boring. They were just sitting there typing away, kind of quiet. Uh, and I was much more into movies and, and you know, stuff like that. <laughs> uh, but, of course, later, of course, you don't realize the storm that's going on inside of your head as you're sitting there typing. So it was always sort of a, a, a wish of mine not to get into that side of the business. And, um, uh, you know, but when you have sort of that became my home base, the years making movies was always uh, writing. I always came back to that, but um, it enabled me to move into producing and directing and, and all that fun stuff. But uh, yeah, my uh, you know the, the the view of movies and television where I grew up, they were always considered like the second tier <laughs> creative endeavor. Yeah. Uh, so because they, they were into novels, short stories, and so forth. Uh, and at the time, I guess that was a generational thing. You know, uh, for me, it was film and TV that was really fascinating so I kind of uh, you know I ended up in, in a fashion back in the, in the family business but with my own spin yeah uh, do you remember the first movie you saw that like really had an impact on you yeah there were there were a few of them uh, my, my father after my parents divorced my father used to take us every um, Wednesday they used to change movies and uh, so we really didn't have a television at home. They didn't think much of TV. So it was really uh, movies. Some of the early movies I saw that completely 
uh, opened my eyes, of course, uh, was Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, oh. that relentless pacing and that chase. And you can kind of get a sense for some of the stuff that I've written in the, in the subsequently, yeah. that idea of pursuit has always been strong in stuff I've done. Um, so that was a huge impression. Jaws was, was enormous to me. Mm-hmm. Um, as uh, when I was about, uh, I forget how old I was, it was like 16, 15, 16, something like that. So it hit at just the perfect time for me. Um, uh, and, and it made a huge impression. And of course, everything Spielberg did since was, was a big, a big impression. But those early ones, um, in, in, in terms of genre stuff, was, you know, uh, uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was a huge impression on me. Uh, and I think that movie never got much love till recently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it was you, kind of when I when I was a kid, it was like this horrible, uh, like near snuff movie kind of thing. But for me, it was just it was it was just enthralling. It was just so terrifying. Um, yeah. Yeah. Those are some of the early ones for sure. Well, well, I think they overhyped it and made it much more scarier than it actually was. It's actually kind of just a black comedy, you know, with Grindhouse, with Grindhouse, you know, um, you know, expectations, expectations, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. But still fun. I, I recently watched it actually, some restoration at a friend's house, and um, we just had a lot of fun with it. It was just a good laugh and a lot of fun. We enjoyed that a lot. Still holds up. Absolutely, it's it's a timeless classic. Um, did you read like Famous Monsters magazine? Of course, Ori Ackerman. I mean, one of the early impression, uh, really impressive uh, people that I mean, it just really was influential was for himself. Uh, I um, had a, I, I forget we went down, and it this was in the summer of I don't know, in the seventies, sometime late seventies. Went down and visited his um, his actual house, and his mm-hmm. house. Sure, you've heard the stories. It was it was like a museum, and it was so amazing to me that somebody was around. That was a guy like Laurie Ackerman. I mean, he was like he had this amazing magazine. It was like this collection of stuff was like so beyond anything that I ever thought I'd be able to see in person. And it was such an impression that um, certain famous monsters constantly looking at that, dog-eared copies of that. And uh, just that whole scene at that point where, you know, they were looking back a lot at the classic monsters from Universal and stuff. And that was, you know, that was a little before my time, of course, but the iconography of it was so deep and it was so out there that I always just found it completely fascinating and I loved it. And that extended to Fangoria when I sort of was, was coming up and, um, you know, those guys were, yeah. were doing stuff. You know, that was, <laughs> you know, that was a real trip. And it was fun to be in that magazine myself. Absolutely. I mean, the horror is timeless. <laughs> <laughs> so you attended uh, UCLA where you studied uh, film and received a degree in English. Uh, are, are you the same generation as like Ethan Wiley and Fred Decker? No. Weirdly enough, the guys who were around UCLA, I mean, well, that's when I met Jeff O'Brow and Carpenter, and yeah. um, we all started doing these low-budget horror movies. That's really when I, Darren Starr was there uh, as a PA. I know it's a re- random connection. Uh-huh. Uh, he went on to do Sex in the City, but he was also around at that point. The guys who wrote um, Michael, um, uh, now my name is, uh, I'm getting old myself, Michael, uh, who wrote uh, uh, Robocop. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. Let me look it up. Oh, I can look it up. <laughs> he, they were, they were, Michael was ahead of us by about four years. And so that he was like one of those amazing stories of a guy who was able to. Michael like, Minor. Minor, yeah. We got it yeah. at the same time. Michael Minor. He, um, he was sort of ahead of us by about four years. He was sort of a wizened um, guy. And then when he had Robocop, it was all like, oh my God, this is possible for us. You know, we can actually crack into Hollywood and actually do something cool. So those are the kind of guys, and Tim Robbins was an actor there. Oh, yeah. Um, Daphne Zaniga was yep. in The Door and the Drip Blood. Carrie Noonan. What's that? Carrie Noonan. I don't, I don't know. I didn't know Gary, but there was also, um, um, I want to say Marcini, um, Chucky. Um, Amy Resnick, she was there. Yeah, and uh, uh, who did Child? I, my mind is blanking. 
the original. Uh, anyway, he was, he was. These guys were around. They were. They weren't. I mean, it wasn't a. For me, I, since I was an English major, I studied every. Um, uh, you know, English. I, I mean, um, a critical studies class that they offered, and then I volunteered on every single. Uh, student film that I could work on, and I did everything. And I got to know Jeffrey Sherman, of course. His father wrote all the Disney music. I'm still good friends with Jeffrey. He's a really sweet guy. Um, he was the first student film I ever worked on. And he went on to a, a very successful career <coughs> writing Boy Meets World. Oh, yeah. Film. And uh, so there was, there was a few of us out there uh, that, that we, we kind of kept in touch through the years. We still are, a lot of us are still in touch with each other. Was John was John Massari around? That name is familiar, but I didn't I didn't know him. Um, oh, you know, of course, um, uh, Alex Cox was there too. He, oh. was, he was ahead of us by a couple three years, and he did um, he did his 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 uh, big debut about the glowing trunk <laughs> Repo <laughs> Man. That was one that that was sort of ahead of us by. That's a great movie. Yeah. 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 Alex Cox. So, they were we were sort of around and it was a, it was a fun time to be there. Um, I always, you know, at that time I also made a lot of good friends with people from USD as well. Uh, Scott Alexander, Larry Karaszewski, and all those guys. And um, so we all sort of worked on these low budget movies together. And it was really Jeff Obrow who uh, was born to drip blood, mm -hmm. power, and then later the Kindred. That was sort of the group that I fell in with. We all started doing doing these movies that we were able to cross over and, and get out of get out of jail. <laughs> get out of jail. Yeah. Get the, into theaters. <laughs> the first movie uh, you guys worked on was The Dorm That Dripped Blood. Yes, yeah. I um I was just so thrilled. I, I was um, hmm. you know, I, I was really interested in, in seeing about taking, trying my hand at, at something on the set and I thought lighting would be really fun and, and so the first day I Moving a light, I pulled the cord and it smashed the entire light. And mm. said to me, "You know, have you thought about the editing room?" So <laughs> I, I kind of got pushed into the editing room. And first thing I did was all the sound effects editing on uh, Dorm the Blood," and also an assistant editor started editing stuff. And we were cutting on film in those days, but um, that was really the, where I got started. Was in the editing room on Dorm the Drip Blood." I had so much fun going off doing gore effects with, we just went shopping and got all, you know, chicken bones and all sorts of stuff to create these, the sound effects. My, my partner, Earl Gafari, uh, he was, uh, he was my editing partner at the time and also a roommate, strange. And we ended up, we're still in touch. He, he, he is now, um, the head music uh, editor at Walt Disney doing all the big, um, animated movies. But, uh, mm. uh, back in the day we were, up in the uh, here, crunching stuff and laughing and having a great time. The gore effect, we just loved it. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then from that, we all uh, went on and did um, uh, The Power, which was, yes. uh, yeah, that one was the first story credit I ever had. Uh, so that was a very special moment for me um, to be able to do that. Uh, to make that jump from the editing room mm -hmm. into the writing side of things it was real significant. And the great thing about Jeff Oprah was, you know, we were just a group of, of kids, and we, were, you know, if you showed an interest in something, you know, Jeff would say, "Well, come on, you know, mm -hmm. let's let's do something." So it was really that that fun kind of a free free spirited um, group of us that uh, just kind of all jumped in whenever we thought we had an idea and wanted to help and. So I ended up getting a story credit on that. And worked very hard on that. And it was a lot of fun. Did editing and um, and a story uh, by credit on there. Shared that. So that was a real fun jump. And mm -hmm. um, after that, we did uh, the Kindred. Yes. Um, that was the <coughs> that was the big. And we jumped into the big leagues. We were on a studio uh, shooting on a sound stage. Uh, I mean, we were. That was sort of moving our gauge of railroad into a little more mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> with Rod Steiger and all that and yep. that was that was the the movie that for me taught me more about writing than um, any anything I've ever done uh, before or since it's when you know having a strange combination of being a screenwriter and an editor on the same movie you're sort of 
seeing the mess that you created on the page and then seeing what you end up with in the editing room. <laughs> you know, you start yeah. noticing things like, wait, why didn't that idea end up getting on film? And you, you start really uh, developing the muscle, at least I did, uh, of really understanding what screenwriting is and how you're just using things you can see and hear and how you're able to... Uh, you have to be very disciplined on a certain level to make sure things actually end up so that they're 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 on the on the on the screen. Um, mm-hmm. You know, early early uh, writers. When you're a young writer, you you're not quite sure where that line is. Sometimes you think there's an emotion that's going to be expressed uh, because you wrote it on the page, and you realize no, you have to set up the situation so the audience can understand what that emotion is. So there was a lot of learning going on. For me personally, mm-hmm. on the Kindred, uh, oh. and uh, had a, just a terrific time, and we were so lucky recently. I don't know if you had a chance, but we had a, 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 a blue, a steel book Blu-ray release of it after all these years. Oh, I I, I didn't know that. I'm gonna definitely get it because I love oh, the, I love the movie. Yeah, so yeah, it's a lot of fun. We had you know it's a rubber monster movie, and and uh, on that on that special edition, they did such a beautiful job with it. Um, we have all new documentary interviews with all of us. Um, so that was a real fun, fun thing. And that's what we're doing these days, it seems, is going yeah. back and revisiting stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, before... Stuck in 80s horror jail yeah. for many years, now slowly being released. Uh, but yeah, so Kindred was a big launching point uh, for me. Uh, that was where everything sort of changed in my, my career. Well, before we, we get into all that, I'm curious to know, how, how did you uh, come to work at New World Pictures? Well, that was another fun one. That was um, after, uh, right before The Kindred uh, came out. There was a period of time when we were writing The Kindred, and I took off in the editing room as an assistant. And um, I worked on, for a, a guy named uh, um, uh, Richard Halsey. Uh-huh. And, his, and his right-hand guy, which was a guy named uh, uh, DeStefano was his last name. Um, geez, I, I should have brushed up on my names. <laughs> what were you called? <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Lorenzo, Lorenzo DeStefano. And the two of us were sort of, it was like a, Richard was doing a lot of work at that point as a supervising editor. Now, Richard came from, uh, you know, Rocky. He won the Academy Award and, and uh, he lost on the Hudson and, and, and edited some amazing things, but New World at that point was sort of a mini major. It was actually a, a well-financed um, studio, mini studio, and they were, you know, pumping out a lot of movies. And um, at that point, you know, I was really interested in editing. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, I was able to do uh, Body Rock, which you know, was a forgettable Lorenzo Lamas movie. Uh, 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 the stuff we ended up recutting that, which was a lot of fun working with them. Um, with uh, 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 again, my mind's going blank, but we, we uh, uh, Cohen Cohen uh, came in and, and actually we got to recut with him the movie, which was great. Um, it, the girls just want to have fun. Yeah, um, a whole bunch of these um, uh, body rock I mentioned, a whole series of New World movies that I ended up. Uh, working uh, in the editing room uh, for, and um, about that same time was when I was doing, uh, I was a, a second assistant editor on uh, uh, Return of the Living Dead, the original. Yep. So I kind of got into that editing phase of my career, and that was just before uh, Kindred. Uh, Kindred was, was the thing, I think that, that took me out of editing, but during that time, uh, pre-Kindred and post The Power, I really had a lot going on in, in working for New World, which was great. Uh, and uh, like I say, Return of the Living Dead, the original, which was a phenomenal experience. That that movie, as an editor, which is, you know, being there in the editing room, was a really uh, it's a, a, an exciting place to be. We were, we were right next to where we were shooting. We were all in this sort of big warehouse out by the Western Center in Burbank. And, uh, and mm-hmm. uh, so we would all, the editing room, you know, we could wander onto the set any time, and we ate lunch with everybody all the time. And, you know, it was just a really fun uh, time. And uh, uh, I'll never forget, uh, the thing that kind of really blew my mind was 
and I walked onto the set with when they were shooting the, the half corpse um, that was laying on the on the um, on the op, on the autopsy table, and Don Calpa, the great actor Don Calpa, was playing the mortician, uh, and he's talking to the to the half corpse, and you know, how does it feel to be dead? And he says, "It hurts," and I said, "Holy shit, this movie is gonna go crazy." I, I remember just on that one detail because. I'd never seen a movie, uh, a zombie movie that sort of took that zombie's uh, experience and tried to put it onto film before, you know, and of course the, the famous, you know, rigor mortis stuff and all that. So being around that while it was being shot was was really fascinating. I felt, boy, this movie, I've never seen, <laughs> you know, zombies being taken from this point of view. And, right. And that to, later on turned out to be a real positive I ended up doing part three. When you when you worked at New World, did you know Steve Haberman? Um, I don't know what was he. Was, which, was he, a, he was the visual and pictorial consultant on uh, B- Body Rock uh, and Transylvania Six Five Thousand. Yeah, I remember when that. No, I I was just I was an assistant editor, so I was really the guy in, uh, in the uh, in the tr- you know the trenches there, taking care of all the <laughs> bringing okay. things here and there and. Uh, you know, syncing up dailies, and I got to cut some scenes, which was fun. But uh, I wasn't, I wasn't up involved in, in, in that high, high enough level. I'm proud to say, though, uh, I have one of the last stuff cups. I met Larry Cohen at, at uh, one of his last conventions, and I got a stuff cup signed by him and Lorraine Landon uh, and Paul Servino. So <laughs> I, that is great. That is great. Yeah. Now, the, the stuff story was fun. I mean, I touched a little bit on it, but what happened was. They, uh, you know, Larry had done a complete cut of the movie. He had an answer print. And back in those days, that, that meant that you mixed the whole movie. All the sound was finished, and it was put on the edge of the film and everything. And and I guess New World picked it up, but they wanted to do some cutting. So I had to take this the print, and I broke it all back down again, and then worked with, with Lorenzo and myself, um, went and worked right with Larry cutting recutting the whole thing. We moved some of the commercials around. Um, we cut down a lot of the, of the material, but it was all with Larry's blessing. It wasn't like, you know, we came in and took his movie and, and ruined it. But the fun thing about that was he was just um, hanging out with that guy. He was yeah. such a trip. He was so much fun. When we had to remix all the sound, so we had to go back into uh, a place called Writer Sound, which is which a, a mixing stage. And um, I'll never forget that Larry would sit there. Uh, there's a little putting green and down in the front, yeah. and in between real changes, he'd sit there and pitch us ideas for movies, one after the other. The guy never stopped. It was so hilarious. Yeah. It was okay. Listen to this one. Listen to this one. And he'd come up with some premise, and I'd say, "Wow, that sounds like a really cool movie." But his mind was so quick, and he could come up with these high concepts so fast. Mm-hmm. It was totally impressive. Impressive. Yeah, I met a completely different Larry. He was very bitter and volatile at the end. Like you couldn't give the guy a compliment, you know. And like really? Lorraine's like, "Oh, come on, Larry. He's a, he, he's a, he's a nice guy, and he loves you. Be nice to him." You know. <laughs> it was it was kind of sad, but I'm I'm glad I got to meet him at least. Yeah, well, I'm glad I got to meet him at a at an earlier point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've I've. That would happen. Yeah, so I, I love the power, and I've talked to Susie Stokey. I think her performance is wonderful in the movie. So what was the genesis of the story? Well, the power was, was really after Dorm's Blood, like I say, the Jeff Obrow group. Uh, we, we were all kind of just hanging out and uh, started throwing ideas around. And um, the, the idea of the Clay Idol sort of first took shape at that point. And then... Um, uh, you're talking about uh, Dorm of Blood or, or Power. You're talking about the Power. The Power, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 right, right, right. Susan Stokey. So um, she, um, her part was always uh, going to be the one who worked for the sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the trashy magazine. And she was always sort of the, the, the one who never believed any of this stuff. And, and that was going to be our story. So that character was always sort of in place. The real fun guy was Warren 
uh, Lincoln. I don't know if you remember him, but mm -hmm. he was the ex-boyfriend that comes to live with her. Yeah. It's all involved in the in the little clay idol. And for, for me, Warren um, was fantastic. He was such a great actor. He really absorbed things and took them in and played them really, really well. And I thought, well, that that's a really a nice bonus. And then, of course, we had Matthew Mungle back on effects. Um, he had done... Um, He's done Lawrence or Blood for us. And then when he came back, we wanted to really just sort of take it up a level. And um, that's when, you know, we talked about doing all those bladder effects where you're pumping bladder into the into the visual effects. And everyone did everything on those movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were, I was an editor, I was an associate producer. I did everything on that movie. And, and we just, depending on what phase you are, were in on production. You either were just working on the set, or you were, or you were in the editing room, or you were in the writing room. You were, you were just all over everything, mm -hmm. and it was just a, a really terrific, fun time making the power. And so we had a version uh, called Evil Passage, I think originally. Yeah. And um, and then what happened was um, uh, Ed Montoro, of course, the famous Ed Montoro from Film Ventures, uh, got. Uh, uh, wind of it and um, agreed to distribute it and what he did was he sunk a few more dollars into it and we recut it and shot some more more schemes so we had we need to up the, the amperage of the, um, of the of the genre stuff and even more tighten it up put in a bunch of new stuff um, and that became the, the movie the power that actually is out there kicking around uh, is it on Blu-ray? I'm sorry? Is the, is the power on Blu-ray? Um, I believe, I'm just looking at my shelf. Uh, yeah, yeah, the power's out there. Oh, yeah. wow, I gotta check it out. Yeah, I'd like to see how it looks on uh, Blu-ray and stuff. I had an oh, old, yeah. old VHS of it years ago. Yeah, no, that was fun. And the other one that sort of led into that was Torment. Remember Torment? Oh, it was shot in my hometown, and what? I interviewed one of the leads, and I ended up not releasing the interview because the person was very condescending and snarky. <laughs> Can you guess who it was? Uh, I, could, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think who it would be. It must be a uh, uh, lead, a female. Um, Taylor. Yeah, Taylor Gilbert, yeah. Bingo. <laughs> I, I really, you know, they came out with a beautiful blu-ray of that just recently yeah um and i i thought i thought uh, uh, uh you know chris uh chris um uh the composer uh did a really amazing job on that yes and chris chris young and i sort of began with dormant blood and i helped him a lot and we're, we're still very very good friends he um he did i think one of the coolest uh, uh compositions for a film uh, that I can recall uh, for for that movie, and and um, you know Warren Lincoln was in it because of the power. We thought, well, I, cause he was so good in the power. I thought, well, you know that that is he still alive? Um, Warren, I don't know. I, I don't. I'm not in touch with him at all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I'm in touch with, with uh, Sam and John, who who wrote and, and directed and produced it. Um, but that movie was also a, a New World picture that was released through New World, but we shot it all so on our own. But, right. But, um, um, Taylor was, was good in the movie. I think she, you know, at the time, because it never, never reached the kind of audience that everyone hoped it would, she you know, probably had distanced herself from it. Yeah. But it, was, it was a lot of fun, and I think it holds up a lot better than than I ever remembered when I saw it again. I, yeah. I think it's a really well done movie. It's a good movie, um, yeah. It's definitely worth another to check that out again. What, um, what, what brought you guys to San Francisco to film it there, though? Um, that was Sam Islani and grew up there. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he produced and directed it with John Hopkins. And John and I, we all grew up in Carmel, California, which is south of, of San Francisco. And we all went down to... UCLA together, and that's where we met Jeff and started doing all those movies with Jeff Obrow, and then they said, well, we're going to raise our own money and use the same group of people. Steve Carpenter was the DP, and then we went up to uh, San Francisco because that house was Sam's parents' house up in uh, St. Francis Woods, so we were able to um, 
create a glass painting. Um, this guy Rocco created this glass painting and shot it like old school, where you're just shooting through this glass painting, uh, and made the house look isolated. But it was really up there in St. Francis Woods in San Francisco. Um, and we um, we ended up um, living in that house and shooting in that house for a couple of weeks, I think, for the principal photography. And then we kept going back and shooting pickups, uh, in, uh, you know, on different weekends, extended days mm-hmm. here and there. And that movie took forever in post-production. We kept cutting and cutting and cutting. Um, and finally, we ended up mixing it. But it was all up in San Francisco, actually. It was all based there because that's where uh, Sam grew up. Um, and we had, he had the resources and the location up there. Mm-hmm. So how it all kind of... We shot a little bit in L.A. on uh, the soundstage, but most of it, the vast majority, was in that house of theirs on Saint, 500 St. Francis Woods. <laughs> I'll never forget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of it. The difference San Francisco, I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah, sure. So, you know, yeah, I, li- I like The Kindred a lot. It's very reminiscent of, like, body horror movies like Cronenberg um, or Stuart Gordon. Was that, like, you know, the, uh, the influence for it? Um, we, I, uh, you know, it's funny because everyone you ask about Kindred has a slightly different intention going on. I always thought what was fascinating for me was the idea that there's this brotherly contact. I was, was related to this creature. So I, was, I had my head in the clouds a little bit. But... Um, but I always, I mean, part, probably for me, the big turning point, you remember altered states when, when, you know, that whole blattery kind of change started happening in the rubber um, silicone world. Um, that sort of was, was a huge sort of step for the power. And then from the power, you know, when you get into Alien and all that, mm-hmm. you know, we were in that league and we had to compete in a way that, you know, it had to be different enough, but that was also sort of the ongoing aesthetic at the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Everyone, when you talk about creature movies, it was alien, you know, and it was like, you know, how, you know, that was like the benchmark. Um, so we knew, we didn't have, you know, CGI or anything to fall back on. So we really had to come up with designs and ideas, and we really went sort of the methacellulose direction, which was, um, methacellulose is the this is a slimy substance that makes everything look wet and drippy and gooey. Um, and so that was probably an influence more from Alien than anything else. Um, you know, uh, I'm talking about the first one, of course. Um, but we really couldn't go into the machine side of it because that Alien was a, a, a xenom, you know, it was a, it was a plant from a different planet. But we, so we kept everything sort of organic feeling. Um, mm-hmm. But it was really... Um, that was that was really, I think, more the for me anyway. It was alien and that whole idea that boy, you can make monster movies that are really going to connect people. Uh, you know, you don't have to just relegate it to being a goofy kind of you know, man in a rubber suit. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I, I was we were always after trying to really scare somebody with it, and we got into the tentacle stuff, and uh, that that was sort of our. our story pattern for the kindred was always like Jaws. Uh, Earl and I were huge fans of Jaws, so for me it was also about, you know, you don't see the full creature till later in the movie, but you start seeing tentacles and and a lot of the structure that Earl and I started working on was, you know, what would you do in Jaws? Well, you have the dog disappear. Remember, like in Jaws, it, 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 where'd the dog go? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. uh, you can kind of trace, I think, personally, at least Earl and I can, um, a lot of the early sort of uh, screenplay structure to Jaws. Uh, creature, terrifying. We had a group of people that are slowly going to be picked off uh, one by one. So those were sort of my influences for uh, yeah, uh, Julia Montgomery is a close friend of mine. She's been on many times, and um, she told me she enjoyed her experience making the movie. Uh, is there any memories of her? Uh, I'm sorry, who was it again? Julia Montgomery. Oh, Julia Montgomery. I always get an embarrassing one. <laughs> I, I mean, not, I mean, she would laugh at it, I'm sure, but I remember that she was in the scene where she had to go um, to the hospital to try to find out what happened to Hart. Right. She discovers that this 
slimy, gooey substance. And it always, I think we were all laughing because it kind of reminded us all of semen at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just so embarrassing that she, I mean, we, we were laughing. I don't know if she ever picked up on that or not, but it, it always seemed so oddly uh, kind of this weird overstone of sexuality. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> just being a young guy, sort of, you know, uh, putting my, my desires ahead of, of reality. But it was always this kind of, it would laugh, kind of always chuckled when we saw that. I don't know why. But she was great in it. Yeah. She really committed. She really committed. She was really terrific. Oh, it's, it's, it's very hard to offend Julia. She's got a great sense of humor. <laughs> um and uh, how did you guys come to get a legend like Rod Steiger? Because by that point, I mean, he had been an Oscar winner. He had been in 100 movies by then. You know, I think his career was yeah. kind of on the skirts at that point, though. But, yeah, I mean, you guys were lucky to get him. Well, that was all um, um, Charlie Meeker and uh, uh, Feldman, Ed Feldman. Ed Feldman came in with Charlie Meeker, created FM Entertainment, where they did, um, they did a series of movies. They did... Uh, um, after Dark, they did The Kindred, they did, I forget the other two. Oh, Hitcher, I think The Hitcher was one of those. Oh, yeah, yeah. Our, we were all part of a, of, a, of a lineup of movies. Ours was the Creature movie. Mm -hmm. And when you have a powerful name, like an Ed Feldman, and you have the umbrella, like I say, The Kindred was really our big mainstream movie. It was the one that we had enough money to kind of do what we wanted. We were based in a real studio. Um, uh, we were at, uh, at Culver City Studios right next to MGM. Uh, at the time, it was called Laird Studios. And we really, it was it was not, you know, we, we weren't looking at it like a, 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 you know, off in the left field kind of indie movie. It was a real uh, a, a movie that, you know, had some financing and, and some position. So through, through Ed Feldman, um, we ended up uh, having access to that level of cast. Um, Kim Hunter, also the famous Kim Hunter from uh, Planet of the Apes, came in, played the mother, which was, for me, a personal thrill. Talk about early fresh movies. The original Planet of the Apes were so important to me. Um, uh, that just blew my mind, that first movie, Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have her, Ian Harpoon, that was almost more exciting than Rod Steiger for a, for a genre guy like me. Um, but Rod Steiger was really um, such a, 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 a funny guy. He loved the practical joke. Mm -hmm. My wife, who at the time was the set nurse, um, you know, he would always challenge people and then, and then see if they were going to wilt from him and run or if they're going to stand up to him and, 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 and get in on the, on the spirit of his ribbing or not. And um, he would rip my, my, my wife so finally she just kind of stood up to him a little bit and then he had complete respect for her and called her Doc and, and um, which was a lot of fun uh, and uh, what for, for, for being a screenwriter seeing what he did with the dialogue was mind blowing he's a guy who you know obviously with his, with his background and his training he was able to take you know pretty not, not eloquent uh, dialogue and he was able to play it like a jazz musician where he would go weaving in and out of the actual text, but he made sure he got the point of that line across, and he made sure that he had the ending of it, just so the other actor would know when to speak again. <laughs> but he was great at, at um, really making dialogue his own, thank God, um, uh, and uh, learned a lot as a writer, just hearing him take a dialogue that I never felt was mm -hmm. super interesting, and then have him just play it and and uh, make it something, you know. We always looked at him as being the Donald Pleasance of the cast, you know. The oh, guy. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get the old kind of name in there, the Donald Pleasance, the Rod Steiger, and then it adds a little legitimacy to the cast. People, you know, uh, you know, can recognize that name. But we also had um, some other really, really good, uh, Amanda Pays. Oh, she was gorgeous. Yeah, and I, I recently crossed paths with her through her husband. Corbin um, Burnson. I'm sorry? Corbin Burnson. Yeah, Corbin, um, later in my career, as you probably know, I've worked a lot with Brian Usna. Yep. And, um, uh, you know, Corbin and Brian and I got together a few years ago, and we're, we're working on some projects together. Nice. And um, I was able to reconnect in Cannes, actually, with... with um, 
with her, Amanda and Corbin and Brian, that we all had lunch together and we were reminiscing about the kindred, which was fun. <laughs> she did that movie right after Oxford Blues. Oh, yeah. Oh, she was gorgeous. Oh, my God. She was just absolutely gorgeous. And also a real down-to-earth funny woman who just, you know, yeah. had a great sense of humor and just down-to-earth. Super, super, still is really sweet, down-to-earth person. Yeah, um, I follow her on Instagram. I'm thinking about reaching out in the future. Yeah, no, she was great. Um, I'm trying to think, we I think we asked her if she would do the Kindred uh, interview, and I, 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 think <coughs> I don't remember. I'd have to look at the... I think she ended up doing the interview on there. We all did separate interviews on the Kindred uh, Blu-ray. Nice. Now, um, I, I think that Return of the Living Dead, the original, is such a masterpiece, and it's yeah. it's got such a dark aura around it because of the tension between Dan O'Banion and certain cast members and all yeah. the mythic yeah. kind of stories. But like you know, wor- wor- working you know as um, as the second assistant editor on it, I mean, what what, what was your experience like? Well, like I, I said a little bit earlier when I was yeah. uh, in the editing room on this thing, we were all together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was, my job was to sync dailies, basically, which was, you know, the picture and the sound had to be um, put together and, and, and sunk up. And that was my primary responsibility. Um, so in the morning, uh, I would be going to the lab and picking up, you know, and then I'd sit there working in the morning, um, uh, uh, you know, putting the stuff together. And then we started getting that some of the takes that we would get, like the split dog stuff, there's no coverage at all. No coverage means that you have a shot you can cut away to. Yeah. And it was just this one long tracking shot. And we were kind of, uh, we were kind of scratching our head a little bit in the, in the editing room saying, well, where, where's the coverage for the scene? And Dan, you know, never had it. Um, and so there was some, some questioning of, of what, what's this guy doing? There was also definite tension um, among the cast. And Clue, Clue, you know, uh, mm. wanted nothing. He thought this was going to be a disaster. Um, I personally couldn't figure out what the tone was. Um, I, I, it was really unclear uh, if this was, you know, the uh, the, um, the barrel guy. Even I would see him walking around, and I thought, well, that just looks like a big guy in a, <laughs> you know, a goofy <laughs> kind of uh, outfit. And I thought, well, I just don't know. So. Um, we, like I say, the things that really stuck out at me were the half corpse that was that blew my mind, um, and and the rigor mortis scene. Yeah. They, were, they were they were getting starting to tie get rigor mortis. I said, okay, there's a bit of genius here, uh, but I never thought the movie would come together. I, I honestly at the time, and it wasn't until we went to the cast, and then I left. Uh, I left that movie after production, um, a couple weeks after the. Production ended, and I went on to Girls Just Want to Have Fun mm-hmm. at New World. And um, I came back and saw the first screening, the cast and crew screening of Return of the Living Dead, and I was, my mind was blown. I said, Holy shit, this is punk rock, this is all to the walls, uh, you know, just all out insanity. And I said, This thing is it, kick ass. <laughs> and it all just came together at the end with that score, that that um, just the speed of it all, and that high energy, and that and, and the just reinvention after reinvention that O'Bannon came up with. But you're absolutely right. When during the shooting of it, and uh, we were convinced there was, I, I was convinced there wasn't going to be much to the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I also remember that um, uh, Dan wouldn't let. Um, it was hard to edit with. Usually during production, you would be editing the stuff as you're shooting it. But Dan was very controlling, and he also had a um, he had a blood sugar issue, so he was always eating a sandwich, um, mm. as I recall. <laughs> and he, he would come in and sit at the after lunch. He would always bring a sandwich and set the sandwich on the editing machine, and and then make comments. And then um, uh, the editor uh, go. Uh, 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 so, uh, Gordon, um, uh, he uh, he would make these cuts, and then we wouldn't have anything to do for the rest of the afternoon. But we had to stick around for dailies uh, to screen the dailies. Um, so we would hang out in the editing room, and we'd start um, start making cocktails. So we would have cocktails <laughs> in the afternoon <laughs> in the editing room, and then I'd wander over to the set, 
and, and see what's going on over there, and I'd watch a bunch of stuff. And, and then come Daly's time, we'd all go off to Deluxe uh, Lab in uh, Hollywood, and we'd watch the dailies. And that was when it was important to take notes of, of what part um, uh, Julie, uh, the, Julie Feiner, the first assistant, was always responsible. She was a woman who helped me out a lot. She got me a lot of jobs. Um, and she was the first assistant on, on Return of Living Dead, the first. Right. And um, uh, ended up uh, uh, doing really well and, and ended up getting me involved in uh, Richard Halsey and all those other groups as well. Um, but yeah. uh, that was sort of my experience, but definitely couldn't tell when you were making the movie how it was going to end up, for sure. <laughs> When, uh, when Brian and I talked a few years ago, we didn't get to talk about Return of the Living Dead 3. Brian's one of those guys, you, you, you ask him a question, he takes about 30 minutes to answer, and I asked him maybe four or five questions during that just roughly two-hour conversation. Oh, my God. I, I tend to go on myself. You can cut me off any time. <laughs> well, you're, you know, you, you've actually let me talk, which is, which is great. But, um, yeah, so, like, like I, I know he had done uh, uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night 4 and stuff. I, and I, I think that was released by uh, Trimark as well. So was that was this part like a, a was this like part of a deal for him or something? You know, it's interesting. Trimark, Mark Amin, who started Trimark, was a he was just a really nice guy. I mean, he was he started in the video business um, and then moved into production. So the original offices that they had were above a video store. <laughs> For the, for the company. So it was a really small group. It wasn't like a big studio. Um, it wasn't later till they got bought out uh, by New World that they became yeah. bigger and bigger. But uh, Brian, prior to that, of course, produced the animator, uh, Ian Stewart. Uh, he produced Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Um, you know, he had a big established career. And so for um, Return 3, um, uh, Trimark bought the title, basically, mm-hmm. um, from from Tom Fox. Tom Fox uh, began it all. He's a guy from Chicago who was able to get the, the rights to, to make movies called Return of Living Dead. And, um, and Tom sold the title, the rights, to Trimark. And so Trimark, looking around, um, were looking for somebody in the genre world that would would take on this project, and um, uh, they got Brian's attention, um, and um, it um, it kind of got put into the mix. They're like, okay, well now we're going to do this uh, Return of Living Dead Part Three, and uh, they didn't seem to have a lot of expectations other than couldn't change the title, <laughs> so. In that way, in that regard, it was it was kind of fun because we didn't we had a really good relationship with the executive there, um, the um, uh, executive who was directly in working with us, and it was a really fun, uh, nice experience. But we kind of they kind of let Brian do what he wanted, um, and and subsequently um, the two of us sort of met and. Uh, I went in, for me, what happened was I went in and, and pitched. He was already going to make this movie no matter what. Uh-huh. And um, so it wasn't about, you know, if he was going to make the movie. So it was like a thing that had to happen. So they were just looking for ideas. And I got a call from my uh, agent at the time and said, hey, are you interested in doing this? They're looking for ideas. I said, well, hell yes, I know that world really well. I, I, it was very impressive. So I went in and pitched the, um, I pitched the, uh, uh, the story, kind of Romeo and Juliet meet, um, meet Nancy, and um, uh, if Brian liked it, that that's the story we're going to do. And so I had done Kindred, and I had been spending a lot of time in development hell. You work for movie studios, and you sell them. I, I sold this to Warner Brothers, and... And you end up rewriting it for a long time. They pay really well, but you never get the movie done. Um, so the opportunity now to suddenly be able to write a script that you know is going to get made, no matter what, mm-hmm. uh, was very exciting. So um, I, I was luckily that it was my premise was pitched. Of course, I never uh, doubted that I would be the one to write. 
write this. I said, what? You, of course I'm going to write this. I, I, I worked on the first one. I'm the only one who gets to write this. Um, naively, I thought that. But uh, so he, um, he did, luckily, I responded to my idea, and I started writing treatments. And then I would go over every night to Brian's house. He was, he was producing a movie called Ticks at the time. And um, I said, during the day, I'd catch up with him on the set of that movie and give him my latest version. And then we'd sit late at night together, and we took ideas around. And he'd kind of comment on what I had done, and then I'd go off and I'd revise it again. So I kept bringing him back revision after revision. Mm-hmm. And at first, uh, I, I was sort of had my, my walls up with Trimark, um, and uh, didn't wasn't sure I should give him the treatment yet. And Brian said, no, 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 just give it to him. And what happened was a really nice thing is that if you're, if you're not um, closed to them, if you, to, you know, in general, to studios, and you show them what you're doing, then they, then they just don't get so nervous, right? And he knew that. He says, just share with them everything we're doing. And pretty soon, I think they got kind of bored reading <laughs> draft after draft. <laughs> uh, we, would, we never stopped showing him what we were working on. And the notes got to be fewer and fewer and fewer. And, and next thing you know, we're, we're, you know, I wrote the draft and I got some notes, but then kept giving him every revision I ever did. And pretty soon we're off making the movie. And I was an associate producer on there as well, based on my previous credits as, as an editor and, and um, uh, my background. And um, Ryan was so inclusive. He was absolutely the most perfect experience I've ever had making a movie, probably years or since. Um, it was it was just such a great time. We had all these great makeup effects people on that movie. I was there every single day. If there was dialogue that needed shifting, Brian would, would look to me and we'd tweak it. And, and I was sitting there watching everything, and Brian was just, he just nailed it. I mean, as a director on that movie, he did something I could never do. He took the visuals to another level. Um, he just always was kicking ass uh, uh, visually on that movie. That was so exciting for me because I said, finally, a script that I wrote that's going to get, gonna get <laughs> nice uh, treatment, you know. Um, and uh, after that movie, Brian and I, you know, kind of stayed in touch through all the years. And we're still very good friends, and we have a new company together now. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, he's a, he's a great guy. Uh, how did you come to cast uh, Kent McCord from Adam Twelve? Were you a fan of that show? I was, and, and you know, little known thing here is that um, I always thought when I was writing that part, it was um, it was supposed to be a um, based after a, a movie. Oh God, now my mind's blank. Uh, uh, in which Robert Duvall played a, a major to Tim Hutton's. Uh, uh, he, he was this really Sounds familiar. character, and I, I, I always pictured of that vibe in my head when I was writing that character. So we knew we kind of wanted to have sort of a an officious um, kind of you know military kind of vibe guy, and then the Kent McCord's name popped up, and I said, "Oh well, Adam Twelve, perfect. You know, he's a cop, known as a cop for years. He would have that kind of authoritarian vibe about him." And I thought that was great. Um, you know, not everyone knows it, but I'm actually in that movie, um, and um, I'm the I'm the the, uh, the private who runs in and tells them tells Kent McCord where that we found his son under the Seventh Street Bridge in downtown L.A. Um, and I I kind of got that part knowing there's no way I can be cut out of the movie because it's a plot point. <laughs> <laughs> So I felt like, sure, I'm going to end up in the final cut. And sure enough, I'm there. Uh, but that was so funny because I had no idea what to do. I couldn't, I couldn't hit my mark. It was just a disaster. Uh, and I felt for him. I thought Brian was going to get someone else to do it. But Kent McCord kind of talked me through it and helped me get, <laughs> figure out how to do it. It was really fun. And then I, I got, I also get killed in the end. I'm, I'm yelling, get out, get out. And then I get swarmed by zombies. So... Uh, happily, I'm I'm in that movie as well, which which mm-hmm. I always chuckle when I see it. That's your Hitchcock cameo. Yeah, exactly. Well, funnily enough, uh, my my daughter, now in her late twenties, uh, is now a veterinarian. Wow. Um, a doctor, and when she 
she had to write her uh, admission letter to UC Davis, um, they always said, make sure you open your your um, your your application letter with something interesting. And the first sentence, of, and this is all her, the first sentence uh, in her application was, when I was, you know, eight years old, I saw my father get eaten by zombies. <laughs> and, and one of the people from David, when she was in, in the program, later came up and said, you know, I remember reading that. And I said, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it served our family well. I was eaten by zombies in that movie. <laughs> is it true that Paul Rudd auditioned for Kurt? A wish now? Is it true that Paul Rudd auditioned to play Kurt in Return to Living Dead 3? That is entirely possible. I don't have a personal recollection of that, but I'm sure, it, you know, it's funny. If you look at back on, if you look at The Dentist, yeah. um, some of the, the actors that Brian had there in minor parts are... Our, our Mark, Mark Ruffalo is one of them. I mean, it's just funny how Hollywood works, you know. Mm. Uh, people um, come and go, and um, and early in their career, they're doing, you know, all sorts of stuff, and then later they they mature into movie stars. We recently I, lost uh, Tony Hickox. What can you say about him? Uh, Tony Hickox. Did he pass away? No, you're kidding me. He just passed away a couple of days ago. You serious? I'm serious. Oh man, I'm really heartbroken. No, he was he had that cameo in the beginning of Return Three. Uh, Tony Tony's great, and and later directed a movie of mine called Contaminated Man with William Hurt. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, I, I I was on a jury with him in Elgin Court uh, with Brian, and Tony, and Jake West, and um, wow, no, I did not know Tony passed away. Wow. Damn. Yeah, I mean, he directed uh, Waxwork, which was a brilliant movie, and Hell uh, Ra- Hellraiser Three. You know, I, yeah, I was, I was shocked. You know, I, I even tried to make a, a connection with him a couple of times. Yeah, I'm sorry to yeah. be the bearer of bad oh. news, John. <laughs> oh well, I, I, I really sorry to hear that. That is just, uh, I did not, um, did not know that. I'm surprised I didn't get notified. But we still have mutual friends, and I. I run into him every once in a while, and we hang out. But uh, oh, jeez. Um, anyway, um, did, um, is it what, true that um, Don Calfa and James Karen declined to be in three? Yes, that is true. They did, uh, but yeah. I got Brian Pat to do it. Um, and Tom, Brian, yeah, Tom Matthews regretted doing too. So I'm sure you didn't go to him. <laughs> yeah, no, it was part two. Never really took off. I don't think there was a reason to do it. Um, there wasn't enough of a new idea, and by the time we got to number three, um, they didn't care. <laughs> we just kind of went our own direction and made it our own thing, and um, and for better or worse, uh, you know, it, it became it has its own identity, um, which I'm really happy about now, in a way, because mm-hmm. um, people remember it as, as a new, different uh, sort of different version rather than just a, a re-carbon copy of the original. Um, it, it, it gets a lot of love, and um, it, it's helped me uh, do some thin times with residuals, so yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it still gives. It's still alive, still getting, still getting residuals from that movie. People are still, still after it, which is great. Um, what was it like uh, working on Jocks? Because I'm one of the last people to interview oh, Steve Carver. God. Oh, my God, I can't believe you knew I... <laughs> well, that one was fun. We worked at Paramount. Um, I, I was I was helping uh, my friend, my uh, editing partner Earl, as I mentioned before. We were doing a bunch of stuff together, and then they needed some dialogue editing done. And we we are we had an editing room at Paramount, so that was really funny to just be kind of suddenly you're you're sitting next to um, the. Um, the editing rooms of uh, of the, of the Paul, of Tom Cruise movie, you know, and you're going, "Wow, what are we doing here with this little movie called John? <laughs> <You know? laughs> we don't belong in this place." Um, but um, John was, was funny, and I actually um, uh, one of the guys who was in it was a guy I went to high school with. Now, oh, Jesus, my God, I didn't know you were going to ask about that movie. 
I was just um, I was just curious because I was the last guy to interview Steve, so I was just I was just curious. He was he was oh, more yeah. pa- he was more passionate about his photography than his filmmaking. I'll tell you. That's so funny. Yeah, I remember Jocks, and and I think that may have come my way uh, from um, from uh, Richard Halsey. I think had something, to, or somehow panned off that job. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget what it was. But yeah, that was yeah. I remember we cut it at Paramount, and I think we actually ended up mixing it at Disney, um, which was really weird because Disney just started opening up when um, Earl and I went on the, uh, on the Disney lot and it was like being back in the 60s. It was really odd. And um, we were like one of the first outside productions and we ended up mixing it there. So they put a lot of money into that, weirdly enough, in the end, Jock, which, which I never thought. Uh, uh, Perry Lang, do you ever hear of Perry Lang? The, the actor? Yeah. Yeah. I went to high school with him in Carmel High School. Wow. And, um, and so he was in Jaw. Yeah. And he was also in, in Spielberg's 19... 1941, yeah. 41, yeah, 1941. That's always the first movie I think of when I think of him. <laughs> yeah, and then also he was in uh, Big Wednesday, I think, yeah. I think so, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the opening. So that was kind of a funny, weird little connection between me and Jaw. was... Perry, Perry, and we knew each other briefly in high school, and then he went off, and I left, and everyone sort of dispersed out of Carmel pretty quickly. There's <laughs> not much going on there for, for film people. That small world, especially back then, there was no internet. Everybody knew each other. Yeah. Everybody hung out. Yeah, it's a different world now. Yeah. Now, I, I know we have a strike going on, but is there anything uh, you're working on? Yeah, I, um, well, luckily, uh, the Writers Guild stuff was settled. I, um, I you know, I, I moved into directing and producing. Um, I'm doing actually the, the, the uh, a Blu-ray 4K UHD special edition of Physics Road, um, the uh, Catherine Heigl, Tom Sizemore movie, mm-hmm. um, which I'm really excited about. I was able to remaster it, and so you can actually see it the way it should have been seen and never was. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, and I've got new projects. Brian and I have a company together called Dark Arts Entertainment, mm-hmm. where we, we have a movie out coming up called The Black Feature from the Lagoon. Um, <laughs> and have, yeah, written by a, a black filmmaker in Indianapolis, which is great. We did another one of his movies called H.P. Lovecraft's Witch House, which is out now. Yeah. Um, and we're moving into, it's a, we were producers rep and executive producers, so I'm doing a lot of that finding up-and-coming filmmakers, helping shape their movies. Um, Brian and I partnered on this thing just to, you know, as a lark to see what would, you know, to some of the smaller budgets, there's not, a, there, there's no money there to have a fee on it. So we, we just take a percentage and then we help uh, shape the movie and, and help with casting and help with the screenplay and, and get it into the shape that we feel it can work in a commercial uh, marketplace. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, so I've been doing a lot of that. I'm producing um, the, uh, a movie. Uh, we just finished shooting a movie called The First with a first-time filmmaker, uh, Susan Ruth, an amazing old, old female uh, mm-hmm. genre director. She's not afraid, doesn't flinch. It's got body horror in it. It's just really cool. I'm very excited about that short. Nice. Um, I got Roy Kinnearum to do the next Brian Hughes that has a, a cameo in it. Um, and um, so there's a lot of stuff going on, and I've, I've sort of diversified, so I'm not just writing. Uh, the latest stuff I've been doing <coughs> novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have three novels out. Uh, one of them is called Truck Stop. Mm-hmm. The other is called Killing Time. And then the one I just released is called It Comes Back. And those nice. are all through the Insight Apocalypse publication. They do a lot of really good um, genre-oriented stuff. Uh, with Peter Atkins is in there, a group of us, uh, screenwriters of, of a little bit um, previous generation, and we uh, are all writing novels, having a great time. So um, and it comes around, so you can check those out. Those, those novels are out there, available um, on audiobook and uh, and uh, Kindle and in print, actually, all three. You can check them out. I, I can imagine writing novels uh, gives you a little bit more freedom to do things because it's just you and the, oh, and the, and the computer. Oh, my. oh, I love it. I love it yeah. so much. 
the, the publisher uh, in Cycle Apocalypse, um, they are so open and so generous and just, you know, the, the training through the discipline of screenwriting has always kept my structures fairly tight. But the ability to uh, get, go into people's minds and to go into the past and to, and to write about things and, 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 and through the words that the, uh, the audience experience things you can't do in film has just been so much fun. And um, they're, I'm really happy with these novels. They've been a lot of fun to yeah. do. So they're, they're another... Uh, you know, another chapter in my cre- creative uh, life that I'm really happy I'm, I'm involved in. And, and then I, I'm, I'm an adjunct instructor at the Los Angeles Film School. I teach writing and directing. Nice. I, uh, I, um, I teach from uh, years of experience having done this. I, I teach people things that work and things that don't work, having done both. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, yeah, so it's been fun. Having a good time. And uh, did, didn't Ray Bradbury give you some advice on writing? He did. Um, again, that, that stems from, he wrote, um, a good friend of my stepfather's, they were roommates for years, um, and uh, he wrote, uh, Ray Bradbury wrote an introduction to my mother's novel. They were all from that novel, Short Story World, right? Mm-hmm. And um, the one that I so desperately wanted to get away with from because I was interested in movies and television, not not. Um, books and ironically now I've come full circle but he was right and he was wrong um, he, he took me out to lunch when I was very young I was 18 years old I had just moved to LA to begin my career and he said well what do you want to do John I said well I really want to write movies he says well if you want to be a writer don't write movies it kind of freaked me out and uh, he starts going on and on about you know, there's nothing between you and the audience writing a short story or a book. And I had written a couple short stories with my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really excited to publish and won an award. Uh, so I kind of had, had that experience. That, and I was, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, shoot, I wanted to be a writer of movies. And it, that kind of, you know, kind of always bugged me that maybe I was doing the wrong thing by sticking with screenwriting. And then, Ten years later, Ray was on a soundstage uh, making uh, one of his movies that he had written and produced, and I was on the next soundstage doing the movie I had been produced, and I ran into him again, and I said, Ray, and, you know, ten years ago you told me if I wanted to be a writer, don't write movies, and he smiled and said, yeah, John, but it's the most relevant art form now, isn't it? And I, <laughs> I just wanted to strangle him on one hand, but he was also about hearing the message, and on one hand he was absolutely correct, uh, to hone your craft as a writer to great work in, in, in the novel and short story arena because there isn't anything between you, the words, and your audience. And in feature films, you have a um, team of so many people, wonderfully talented people, mostly most of the time, um, that uh, are working and um, interpreting your screenplay. Mm-hmm. So it was both frustrating, frustratingly, frustratingly correct and uh, long at the same time. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Ray was uh, definitely a mentor to me, for sure. Sure sounds like it. Uh, do you ever do the horror cons? I did horror con last year uh, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, I was signing books. I was signing copies of, of Truck Stop and Killing Time. And I hopefully we're going to do some this, this year with It Comes Back, a new novel. Yeah, some of them. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy that. It's fun. Uh, yeah. You keep with your T-shirts on for your movie, and then that's always a blast. You see the, the yeah, it, love for what you've done in the past. It's appreciated. It's amazing, you know, and it, it's just... It's, it's become bigger than I ever thought it would. I remember when I was a kid, it was a very rare thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, the, the whole story of zombies is so funny to me. I would return three. My sister thought was appalled by it. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I can't watch that. <laughs> and now I cut to she is the biggest fan of The Walking Dead. I mean, this woman walks out her entire Sunday night with friends and it's just has dinner and does nothing. She's all about Walking Dead. Of course, now you know it's calmed down a little bit, but. A couple of years ago, she was like a fanatic, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" I said, it's, "We were doing that crap years ago," <laughs> and I think the rest of the world finally caught up. 
I think they, they have, absolutely. Well, John, I thank you so much for coming on today and sharing these great stories, and I'm glad you're still out there being creative. Have yourself oh. a great rest of your day, and be safe out there. Okay, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. John Penny. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy, huh? Great stories. And, yeah, I mean, <laughs> he loved to talk. Not as much as Brian did, though. Brian really loves to talk. But uh, it was great listening to John. He had great anecdotes there, and I'm glad we talked. Well, until next time, this is Tabby Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!